shepherds saw the angels, the angels appeared to them and they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. They declared the glory of the Lord, we want to do the same. So would you stand together, please, as we lift our voices, saying, Hark the herald angels sing, but that's also our message. Glory to the newborn king. Hark the herald angels.
seated. Several of our Christmas carols, the traditional ones, go back long, long time ago. One of them is God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. It's been sung for at least 250 years as part of the church and celebration of Jesus coming. And the idea is the rest as in being, being rest assured, not sleep. May God give you a good night's sleep, but it's got, may you have a good trust in what God has done. And I guess the original title was something like, God keep you resting in the assurance of your bountiful joy and gentleness which is a little unwieldy to sing and even to read, but that's what we're talking about, that God just allow us to rest in what he has done. So we want to share together. It's God, rest you, merry gentlemen, women, everybody, in what God has done and accomplished. share together family time. It's good that Linda is back and Ella is here, although she's going out right at the moment, but we're glad that our newest addition, Ella, is present and we get to see her and uh, rejoice over her and glad that Linda's back from surgery and doing well. She came in with her cane and threatened to hit me, was it? No. (laughs) I got too close. But glad you're recovering and that you're out and around. Good. And glad you're all here today. Christmas time is an interesting time with people traveling and celebrating, and you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, people are, I know, are, have gone out of state. Is what I keep praying for one another that we could just continue to celebrate the message of Christ. And that's what we're going to do this morning is we continue to focus on what Jesus has done for us. Uh, so in the sermon notes on the back side, there is a, an article that's talking about keeping Christmas. And so it's from Henry Van Dyke. So it's an interesting read about what we can do to maintain Christmas as we understand that it's not just build up to one big day and then uh, we don't need to think about Jesus anymore like so many people in the world do, but we want to just keep Christ the focus. So that's just one way that you can think of it. And there's also other ways. And one of those is to make sure that we keep reading our Bibles and understanding what Jesus has done. So we have Bible reading schedules out on the info center, variety ones, whether it's going through chronologically or bouncing around Old Testament and New Testament. Pick them up, use them, and just encourage you to make sure that we all are feeding ourselves and not just depending upon one time a a week. But so again, they're Lots of different avenues to get God's word into our lives. Ushers, would you 
come forward so we can worship by giving of our offerings to the Lord. Let's bow together, please, to prayer. God, we are grateful that we can celebrate Jesus Christ, and as we have done throughout this season and on Christmas Eve and then Christmas together with family or whether separately or individually or and today and that we would not just make it just the, the big thing and then kind of collapse afterwards and I don't think we do that as here as this pe- as people here but we want to just maintain thinking about Jesus and focusing on him what he has come to do so help us to continually do that and be able to continually talk to people about Jesus who lots of folks will now, tomorrow, just kind of close the door on it and move on to New Year or whatever that's on their minds. But help us to keep Jesus at the forefront of what we do, but also then how we live our lives and how we can share that. Thank you for the blessings that you do give to us and that you give us hope and peace and joy and love and that you... Bring those to us because of who Jesus is and what he's done. So we would ask that you would guide us and direct us as we live our lives, as we are out in the community and with neighbors and family members, that you would give us opportunities to talk about Jesus, to talk about the truth, that we would be clear when we have the opportunities, that we would be prepared, and that we would just again think about what Jesus has done and just be moved by the incredible love of Jesus Christ from coming from heaven to earth to die for us. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for the recovery that you're giving to Linda. Continue to strengthen her and draw her closer to you during this time. Thank you for this new life of Ella and that just we can marvel again about the, the birth and just the illustration she is about the new birth that we have through you and that how you desire to continue to make things new. May we look forward, even as we are moving towards the new year, that we desire to see you work new things in our lives as individuals and as church family, and that we would see you move, and that we would desire to, uh, uh, just again, to keep on moving and growing and building our relationship with you. Thank you, God, that we can be together this morning to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We see depictions of the manger scene or movies. There's awful kind, often a jumble of you know the bring the wise men there, even though they weren't really at the the stable. What is kind of a combination, but they are part of the Christmas story because it's part of the birth narrative of the early years of Jesus Christ, and they made an incredible journey to come see Jesus Christ. So our scripture this morning is taken from the account of the Magi, the wise men. If you'd like to follow along, it's in Matthew chapter two. Um, as Matthew and Luke are one of the places that re- record the, what 
People say, that's the Christmas story, because it talks about shepherds and Jesus and Joseph and Mary and the, the wise men. So we want to look at Matthew chapter 2 this morning and just see what, how they fit in and what they were doing and what God was doing in their lives. So Matthew chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you... Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. be interesting to see what these people really are like. There, there are all sorts of traditions about them and giving them names like Kaspar and uh, I don't remember the other ones. Melchior, I think, is one. Whether, where they came from and how they met together, but they came to Zair to worship Jesus Christ. And they format for our song as we think about these gentlemen who've come and the, the gifts that they give and the gifts that we can give. It was originally the song was uh, known as the Quest of the Magi. And the man who wrote it was, uh, I think he was a single gentleman. He was a pastor. And he, each year, would write a new song for his nieces and nephews. And they all looked forward to him writing these songs so that they could just have something at their family get-togethers. Well, it became more than that, obviously, as it became part of the pageant in New York City in 1857. And the song, and just from there, it just kind of blossomed. People latched onto it, singing about these, and just the imagination of these three wise men coming on camels over hundreds of miles to see Jesus. It's in a house, so maybe up to two years old, but they came to worship him. So would you stand together as we sing about the desire that we want to worship him, even as the Magi did.
please be seated. The Christian men rejoice is even older than these hymns. It dates back even maybe from the 1300s. And it was written basically from the viewpoint of the angels, who are the ones who are saying, listen up, everybody. Continue rejoicing, continue focusing. It's a reminder that no matter what happens. And if you're up on your history from the 1300s, you may remember that there was, it was not a great time for the world. There was the thing called the Black Death was raging throughout Europe. Widespread famine, the Little Ice Age was there, and so it was creating havoc for people in the way they were living. But someone, don't know the man's name, talked about this, said, good Christian men, rejoice. Because why? Not because of stuff going on, certainly not, but in spite of that, because of Jesus. And they even said that the English translation, which is a little bit long again, but it says, In sweet rejoicing, now sing and be glad. Our heart's joy lies in the manger and shines like the sun in the mother's lap. You are the Alpha and Omega. Again, that doesn't quite roll off the tongue as much as somebody with a more modern translation. But the idea is that rejoice in who God is and what he's proclaiming. So let's sing together. remember from this past political election that one of the slogans that was out there was promises made, promises kept. Well, it's not exactly a new campaign slogan or idea since it's been around since at least the late 1960s, but just people grab it and gravitate to it and think it's fairly new, but it isn't. And there's a variation that's been around, it's promises made, promises delivered, which is also used by politicians trying to, again, build into what they've done and accomplished. But it's the, I've seen, as I checked it out, a sports betting agency. Somehow, you know, you're making the promises, you're betting on something that's uncertain, but they said, promises made, we deliver. That's part of it. And also, Giannis Antetokounmpo from the Milwaukee Bucks, when he first arrived as a rookie, apparently said something that he's making promises, that I promise never to leave here until we make this a championship-level team. Well, some people, if they remember that, they've made it now. I'm wondering, is he going to leave? Who knows? But the most intriguing one I saw was from a guy who delivers mulch. And he had, was doing a selfie like this, and behind him is his dump truck, his big truck, dumping out mulch. And he's just, ah, and he's just yelling and screaming, kind of trying to be like the truck that he's making promises delivered. And so we deliver mulch. Promises made, promises kept. Oh, good for him. I didn't even turn up the volume because it just, you just saw his face and his mouth just, okay, you get the idea. Well, the intent is fine. People saying we make promises, we keep the promises. But the, really the only person who can say that I've always keep my promises is God himself. His promises that he makes, he has kept. 
them, and he will deliver on them. And that's because he's the almighty God of the universe. And the Old Testament is full of promises called prophecies about the Messiah who is to come. Most biblical scholars say there are maybe 300 specific prophecies that we can use that point to the Messiah, and they dig into what some of the Jewish rabbis said, although there are some Jewish rabbis who say maybe there are like 675 different references to the coming Messiah. Not all is first coming. Well, for them, they lumped together the coming and to be the king as one because they didn't really see the fulfillment of Jesus being the prophet, the, the Messiah. But there are prophecies about the Messiah slash the Christ, the anointed one, whichever way we want to think about that. A man named Peter Stoner started doing some math. And I know we just celebrated Christmas, and a lot of people don't like math to begin with, but it's a visual kind of math thing, so it helps us. So we took eight specific prophecies related to Jesus Christ coming, to his first coming, or he said to any person coming. And so he said, well, specifically, because we think about Christ. And he illustrated how difficult it would be to fulfill those eight prophecies. He suggested taking the entire state of Texas and covering it with silver dollars a foot deep. And then, well, let's think about how big Texas is. So a foot deep. Texas has 268,820 square miles. When you multiply the square feet, that's almost 7.5 trillion square feet. And he's talking about cubic feet. So you've got, you're getting... 15 trillion cubic feet. I see Clint's mind going because he works with travel and trucks and stuff and all money. How many truckloads would that be of stuff, of just gravel or something? But it's a 15 trillion square feet, cubic feet. They said take one silver dollar and mark it. How do you want to mark it? Paint the whole thing red, whatever, put a red X in it put it someplace in the state of Texas, and somehow stir up the whole state of Texas, all two feet deep of silver dollars. And then you have the opportunity to go grab one silver dollar. And the chance of you grabbing that one specially marked silver dollar is the same as those eight prophecies being fulfilled in one person, in any person. But Jesus fulfilled not just those eight prophecies, but he's fulfilled those 300, although some of them are yet to be fulfilled. So all the ones that were for his first coming, he perfectly fulfilled, whether where it was born or how he was going to die, how he was going to enter Jerusalem, those particular things. But Jesus perfectly fulfilled all of those. And in the birth narrative, even as we read earlier, there are promises that were made to people who are alive at that point in time. Earlier we saw how Zechariah and Elizabeth were promised that they were going to have a son even though they were old and beyond the time for having kids. Joseph was promised that the son who would be born to Mary would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And this was a motivation for him not to divorce Mary, but he also understood that he was to give him the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Now, he didn't see the completion of all that, But he understood and put it in practice, giving him that name. Mary was promised that she would give birth to a son whom she would be called the son of the Most High, who would be the ruler of a never-ending kingdom. Saw part of it, but not the completion of the promise. The shepherds were promised that the Savior had been born, and he was lying in the manger, and they could go check it out for themselves. Simeon and Anna had been waiting for the promise of God to show up in the person of the Messiah, and they recognized it in Jesus as the baby. It had been communicated to the guys we just sang about a little bit ago, the wise men, but through a star that they said the promise that the Messiah, the king, has been born, and they they could go visit. So how did these people respond? Zechariah marveled. He just, and he lost his voice for a while because he marveled and he couldn't really believe it. Mary believed and pondered. The shepherds accepted it and went to check for themselves. It's kind of the version of trust what was said and verify. They wanted to make sure that was true. Simeon, Anna, and the wise men worshipped. And they just bowed before Jesus and they presented themselves to him. 
The Magi traveled hundreds of miles and spent a fortune in what they were going to do. And with all of them, there was some waiting involved. As lots of times the promises are, here's the promise, maybe not yet. And people often talk about the way we live, we're living in the present, but it's not yet. We got, it's not all completed. There's much more for God to fulfill. No matter how long it takes, God fulfills his promises. And it's evident in the Advent themes. God fulfills his promise to give hope, peace, joy, love. And as we saw on Christmas Eve, he gives light, the ability to see God and to understand and to put our trust in him. These are all possible because Jesus is the promised life from God. So we're going to go to a passage that some say really is the best Christmas passage, even though it doesn't talk about shepherds, it doesn't talk about the baby in the manger, it doesn't talk about these things, but John chapter 1, because it really encapsulates what Jesus came to do. So our focus is going to be in John 1, but we're going to bounce around to other places in the book of John as well. But start off with John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 4 at the moment. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. One of the key words in the book of John is the word, word. It isn't because it's frequently used especially not in this context, but in the first verse, it's used three times as, and it's cap, capitalized. It's used as a proper name. And that's why it's important. It's about what it signifies. And it sets the tone really for the entire book. As book of John is one of the gospels. It's God's word to us. It's God communicating Jesus. And that's what he's presenting. Now, the idea of word, as used by the ancient Greeks, was not just what somebody spews out of their mouth, talking about words, but it's also what's locked in their brain, the thoughts, the activity that's going on there. And it's the word, it's just the rational concept, rational being, and they thought that this kind of rationality is what governed the entire universe. It's a rational principle. Jews, on the other hand, would use the word capitalized and think about it as a way to talk about God because they were very careful about the way they talked about God. They didn't want to use his technical name because they might mispronounce it and that be using God's name in vain. So they used other words for God and they talk about him as the word, or this being. So the idea of John using the word communicates to all people groups, whether you're just thinking about stuff that's spoken out or it's a rational principle or a name for God, but it's talking about this being God. And the word is described as divine. It says the word is God. It's also a distinction because it says that he is God, but there's a separateness to him. So we have God the Father and then God the Son, which is the word. So they're, they're connected, but there's separation. And he says everything that God is, that you can imagine God to be, the word is. The word is everywhere present. The word possesses all knowledge, is all powerful, he's eternal, has always existed. He's immutable, can't change, there's no fault in him. He's self-existent, he's self-sufficient, he's infinite, he's completely holy, and he rules over all because he is God. The word is God. So these are staggering and mind-blowing attributes. And the ones emphasized in these verses, though, are the eternality of the word. It says he was with God in the beginning. He was God. His creative function, that he made everything. And that he possesses life in and of himself. So no one gave life to the word. He's always had it. He has his own life principle. He, this is the essential part of his being is being a being. He is a being. It includes power and functionality and moral operations, and it's the opposite of death and sin. He is the word, he is life, a complete life. Now we note then it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
We have to go, let's see, verse 14 for that. The Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. It's equally staggering to think about his attributes, but his, his willing to leave that, everything is godness and not cling to it, but he's willingly decided to put a temporary hold on all of those things, on exercising his power and his position and his authority as God. So he left the glory and splendor of heaven, trading it for a cattle feed trough. He swapped the robes of deity, whatever you imagine. When we visualize God, we imagine him like a person in his glory and his being, how he's wrapped in splendor and put clothes. He traded all that for strips of cloth in a manger. He had been surrounded by the symphony of angels who would sing his praises and he comes to earth, and the people who are his courtesans, the people in his court, are lowly, smelly shepherds, the ones that are around nearby. From filling the expanse of the universe to being confined in a womb. From creating the universe to having fingers that are unable to grasp the straw in his manger. He willingly and humbly laid aside his glory, the glory of the supreme being of the universe, so he could become a human being. The Son of God did this to serve us, to experience all we do. The hurt, the pain, the suffering, the indignity, the brutality, and yes, the good things as well, but also the temptation. And he did it all without sin so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for people who are sinners. He came to be Emmanuel, God with us. God wrapped in physical touch, in skin, so we could see and hear and touch him. Another major concept of the Gospel of John and his letters is the idea of life. We've read it a couple times already. But it's used at least 36 times throughout the book of John. And at least 15 times in his letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Twice Jesus identifies himself as the life, using the words, I am, as the life. The first comes when he tells Martha, who's grieving over the death of her brother Lazarus. He tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, he used the word lives again, so you add that into it, and it just it keeps multiplying the number of times talking about the life and living. The second time when Jesus was used it, he was in the process of comforting his disciples. It was the night before Jesus was going to be sacrificed on the cross, and he was talking with the disciples in the upper, upper room, and he told them, you trust in God, trust in me. But the, he had told them prior to this that he was going to be beaten, and he was going to be scourged and mocked, and he was going to be killed. And there's all this uncertainty, of, and they had many thoughts going through their minds just at warp speed about what was going to take place. And just think what it would be like to be with them at that point, and to think about what was going to transpire. And so Thomas, who's often given in the knock of being the doubter, but he may not have been so doubtful as just saying, I need proof, just like everybody else did, and they would have been in the same situation. But he attempts to get more understanding, because he said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? You said what's happening, you're going to heaven, you're preparing place, but you're kind of leaving us up the creek without a paddle is what he's kind of feeling like. So Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody gets to the Father except through me. So Jesus is life. He proclaims that. I am life. Standing right with you, before you. I am life. And that would be great. We can worship this being whose life, but the most important thing is that Jesus then gives life to us. It wasn't enough for him just to possess life in himself, because you know if he didn't share it, where would we be? We would have no hope, but he gives his life to us. And he came to share life with people. 
And to underscore that, Jesus would talk about people as being like sheep. That we're just a bunch of sheep who, I guess, I've never been really close to them, but I've heard that they're stinky and smelly and there all sorts of stuff going on. They can be cantankerous, who go their own way and they get lost and they do all sorts of weird things. We he said, we're like sheep. And he says, he came to give life to people. And he gives another of his I am statements. If you want to turn to John chapter 10, we can see those there. John chapter 10, where Jesus is talking John chapter 10 and verses 7 and 9, he uses the same one twice. In verse 9, he simply says this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. He says, I'm the gate. If you enter through me, you'll be saved. You will get life. But let's look a little bit further in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then go to 15. said, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And then 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the gate. And he's in the position, talking about his position and purpose. And he had authority to lay down his life. And he had authority to pick up his life. And he was the one who do it. Nobody could take it from him. Nobody had the ability to kill Jesus. There's nobody who could do that. But Jesus said, I lay down my life. I allow it to happen. I allow myself to be killed. I surrender myself. And it's through his death and life that we're able to overcome death and receive life from him. And later in John 10, we find out more about this gift. Skip ahead to verse 28, where Jesus again says, we're talking about sheep, said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. Father and Son are acting in cooperation with one another, and they both give life, and that Jesus is the life giver, and they're doing the same thing. And no one can take people who place their trust in Jesus Christ out of his hands or the God's hands, because they are one in the same. And then in another spot, he uses another of his I am statements, which he connects the concepts of light and life that he would bring to people. And he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And there's still another of the I am statements. We're basically covering all of them except for one. He says, I am the bread of life. So he proclaimed he's the God-given bread of life, the bread who comes to give life to the world. And whoever eats of him, comes to him, believes in him, says we'll never go hungry or thirsty, but we'll have everlasting life. And the promise from Jesus is because I live, you also are going to live. Jesus is the life giver. So with Jesus linking the I am statements to him giving life, seems like he's trying to make a point, doesn't it? He's not just saying, okay, I'm, I'm the, I am, but he says, I am, and I am making the, the, the statements that I am the life giver. It doesn't come from anybody else, only comes from me as the Son of God. So he is the bridge between people and God. He's the bridge that crosses the great divide, and his cross bridges the great divide. So the condition is that we need to believe in him. And Jesus said this, over and over again. We've seen this already in the conversation with Martha, because Martha said, yes, I do believe. The disciples were confronted with they needed to believe. Jesus described himself as the bread of life, about needing to believe. And the purpose of the book of John is seen in this verse. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by By believing, you may have life in his name. So let's go back to John chapter 1 again. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. He, Jesus, the word was in the world, and though the world was not, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own 
but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or, or of a husband's will, but born of God. There are those who don't see Jesus for who he is, for who he claimed to be. Jesus interacted with many of them and said, even though they're well acquainted with Scripture and they claim to know what Scripture said and they claim to believe it, they didn't see Jesus in spite of all their study. And Jesus criticized from them, said, you should see me because I'm the one who can give you life. That basically describes the Jewish people by and large. They rejected Jesus. Today, there are people from all cultures and ethnicities who refuse to accept the life Jesus gives. They know about him. They can recite the story about the Christmas, about all the things that put people in the right place and the right time in the Christmas story. They may even memorize scripture, even as a, a Jewish man memorize the entire Bible, but he's an atheist. Made no, no difference in his life. He could know it and he could quote it better than we could, but just bounces off his head. And there are lots of people who, the same thing today, they, they can understand the Bible, but it doesn't lead them to Jesus who, to receive life. They don't put their trust in the evidence. The New York City Metropolitan Muse Museum of Art a number of years ago had a very elaborate nativity display. And there were figures from the 18th century. And there are at least 200 figures that they used to adorn, you know, wherever this art display was. And most of them were looking up at the sky, maybe at the angels, or looking at the manger in anticipation or worship. But there was one man who was bent over carrying a big, heavy pack on his back wasn't paying any attention to anything else going around, just in his own little world. And he really represents what people try to do in their own little world, ignoring what's going on because they figure, well, I've got to carry the burden myself. I've got to carry it and I try to get there by doing whatever I can do. And they're just, or maybe they're just so weighed down with life that they don't pay attention to what Jesus has to offer. And they won't look at him. But they're, whatever way it is, they're rejecting Jesus. And that's the sad part. The good part, the happy part, is in verse 12. says the need to believe, and you've probably figured out believe comes through lots of times in the book of John as well. It's another dominant word. And it's often connected with receiving life. And we've seen some of them, and I've counted at least a dozen times when that takes place, where you believe and you get life. That condition is a people have placed their personal trust in Jesus Christ as the one who could deliver them from their condition of committing sins against God, being separated from God. The result, it says, is eternal life. Those who receive Jesus and believe in his name are given the right to become children of God, he gives life. It's the person who knows God. This scene in the encounter of Jesus with the teacher Nicodemus. He had heard about Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to talk to him and have just discuss some things. But this teacher was confused about what Jesus was talking about. He didn't grasp it and about the whole idea about being born again, or it could be said as being born from above or being born spiritually, a second birth. He just didn't get it. And Jesus at that point spoke a lot about believing and placing his trust in him, including the most familiar verse, John 3, 16, where it talks about believing, have life. But just prior to that, Jesus said, everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. That's 315, which we often don't pay attention to. Then just afterwards in 17 and 18, he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And then Jesus brings in the concept of light and says that light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil and they don't want to come to the light because they enjoy being in the darkness. He says, "Whoever, however, those who live by the truth will come into the light. Nicodemus, somewhere along the line, placed his trust in Jesus as Savior. Maybe at this point. We don't know, we don't see much or hear much about him until really the end of Christ's life, after his life, when he joined 
to, to take help Joseph take the body of Jesus and prepare it for, prepare it for burial, put it in the tomb, and that the two men were expressing their faith in Christ at that point, and they were willing to go on the line and said that they had knew Jesus. But that's not all the life. It's not just eternal life, because John 10.10, 10, that I come to give them life, and I've come to give it abundantly, to the full, with fullness, overflowing. The life which results through Christ's coming is contrasted with what people had before, before they knew Jesus Christ, what we had before. So it's more than just an upgrade or just a little bit better than what you have. Maybe you know, instead of getting just a, you know, if you rent a car and you get the eensy teensy one and the guy says, no, you, you can have this big honking car. You can have the Lincoln Continental, although everything is for free. Well, that's nice. But that's still not exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us, because he says he not just upgrade or something a little better, but we have grace instead of wrath and hatred, cruelty, and disfavor. We have truth and not lies or deception. We have real nourishment, spiritual nourishment, and not famine. We have don't have the experience of the world whose life here, even though it might be filled with some really great stuff, at least in their imagination and their thoughts and the values of the world, but really it's a precursor to eternal punishment. But we have spiritual life of wholeness, which begins now and carries on through eternity. We have a shepherd who guides and protects and provides, rather than thieves like thieves that we might not Think of these as thieves often enough, but they are thieves like pleasure, performance, possessions, position, pursuits, or the devil who really seek to kill and destroy and to ruin us. We have a God-ordained meaning and purpose and significance. So it's not just existing, hoping, fingers crossed to get by. But we have a reason for living, a reason for being. It's not just existing, but blessed. Not, it's life, not death. So we have the navigation tools we need to make it through this life. I heard someone on the radio, and then I was for a program that was coming, going to come on. I didn't listen to the program, but I then tried to do a search to try to find what he had said exactly. So I don't have as a quote because I couldn't find it. But he said something to the effect, if the, the message of Christmas you've heard hasn't brought you joy and made a change in you, then maybe you really haven't heard it or understood the message. If it hasn't given you joy in all these other things, maybe you really should think about what you've heard or what's the message you're paying attention to and that you need to get the good news of great joy. Doesn't mean we're happy and giddy all the time, as we talk about when we talk about that gift of joy, but this idea of what God does for us, and it will well up in spite of some of the things that are taking place. It says that it overflows so we can share with other people. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow out from us to others. And Howard Thurman put it this way. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, and when the shepherds are back with the fields, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate the light of Christ every day in every way in all that we do and all that we say, then the work of Christmas begins. It's to overflow because we have life. It's not just, oh, Merry Christmas now, Christmas, but it's throughout the year. And we might even try that sometimes, just freak people out and say, Merry Christmas. They look back at us and say, why are you saying that? Well, here's why. It might be a conversation started. We could try that. It would be a challenge for all of us to think about it. Because the life is supposed to overflow from us. And it will because we know Jesus and we have eternal life. So we celebrate Jesus. Like Zechariah, we should marvel at what God has done. Like Mary, ponder these things. Let them keep going through our minds. Like the shepherds, trust to leave what they're doing and do something different. Like Simeon and Anna and Magi, who waited or traveled a long time, what time and spent fortune to worship. We come to worship him. And we wait for the promise to be completely fulfilled, 
We have some now, but it's not completely yet. But we believe. Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ in coming and realize that there is so much more to the story and that we are ever learners. Help us to be learners, practitioners, as we think through what you have done for us and the great news that we have for ourselves and that we desire to let it flow to other people. And we're thankful again that you've come to give life as the word, the one who has spoken from God and spoken clearly. So may it make profound changes and may we think about our lives and say, what changes should it be making and that we would desire to allow you to make them in the way that we live our lives, the way we live our lives with other people. In your name we pray. Amen. We stand together, please, as we sing the song that talks again about what Jesus Christ has come to do, about the came about the midnight a long time ago, but it's still current and relevant for today. together please and I have a prayer that's been written by a woman it talks about what we need to do in light of living in Christmas and how we need to carry it through the years she says in a world where where worry not peace prevails stir up that good news again this Christmas make it real in our hearts never have we needed your joy and peace more than now thank you for the gift of Jesus our Emmanuel the word made flesh Forgive us for forgetting that your love never changes, never fades, and that you never abandon the purpose for which you came, to save us from our sinful condition and to give us life eternal and the joy of a relationship with a holy God. Your birth and your death sealed your promise to us forever. Your name is still called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. As your children, we cry out for a fresh filling and a new awareness of who you are. We choose by faith to make the good news of great joy a reality in our own lives so others can see us as lighted trees of life pointing to you this Christmas. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And we also know that peace on earth can only come when hearts find peace with you. You are still our joy. You are still our peace. You are no longer a babe in the manger. You are the Lord of lords and King of kings. 
And we celebrate you as Lord this Christmas and always. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.